Yes, I, I want to take you up on that point, uh, Demetra, because you were saying, and I think I totally agree with you, that the harnessing of disorder occurs in the universe even before life emerges, because you can see it in the various systems you've described. I mean, we can see it in the weather systems, can't yeah. we? How, how does a tornado come to be so ordered? And yet it, it's starting with particles that are everything but ordered. And, well, we know, of course, there's, there's motions of uh, heat and so on, and, and it all gives rise in just the way you've described for the early universe to uh, forms emerging, if we can put it that way. Now, I think that's very important because... After all, life did not come from nowhere. <laughs> and we have this big issue, how on earth did life emerge in what seems to be a non-living uh, universe? Well, I would say that the fundamentals for being able to do it already existed. The ability of structures within the universe to already be harnessing the disorder they experience and they harness is, as it were, a first stage to getting to the point at which once you create, um, well, I would call them the earliest cells that existed, the earliest things that could um, encapsulate a set of molecules that could have a reaction that continues and be a self-reproducing system. See, the thing about a tornado is it eventually hits the ground and, and, mm -hmm. and all the energy gets dispersed and it's gone. That's that. The interesting thing about living organisms is precisely that. They are alive. Now, for that, you needed to have the constraint of something creating the environment. That's why it would have to be a, an enclosed cell to enable those reactions to be continuous and to keep maintaining themselves. And that's the origin of life. The ability not only to harness the stochasticity, the, the chance, the disorder, but to create a system that actually maintains itself against all of that. And that's the sense in which organisms are living on the edge between order and disorder. And it all really comes down to living on the edge between order and disorder and the relationship exactly between... So. Yeah. between symmetry and asymmetry or, or, or order yeah. and disorder. I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to read it. Oh, sorry, Ian, please. No, I just wanted to comment on something that we yeah. haven't talked about, which is very important, which is that while it is ordered, it is not determined. That there is, and that is a very important yeah. point. Exactly so. Uh, and, and, you know, th this is also not just physics, but is through the whole business of our lives. Mm -hmm. At every scale, things are orderly, but not they cannot be finally predicted deterministically. Indeed, uh, yes, and again, we're back to creativity, aren't we? Which I think has to yes, be exactly. the characteristic of living systems that they can create the situations in which they can better mm. help themselves to be alive. Okay. Can I just ask Dimitri for something? In the 1950s, did not two Japanese physicists win a Nobel Prize for showing that the assumption of symmetry is wrong because the weak force doesn't exhibit it? Uh, yes, actually, you're quite right in saying that. Um, and, and that has been, I mean, since then, sort of um, incorporating all of these forces has been a major, major challenge for us, yes, right? Yes, I'm sure. Um, creating the supersymmetry, uh, mm -hmm. if you wish. Um, and I, I think we're not quite there yet uh, in, in physics. Uh, for, from a pure physics point of view, I think we're just not quite there yet. But I, I, I wanted to sort of, I, I, to say that I agree with you on this, uh, it, as far as the universe is concerned, at least, that this is not a deterministic universe. It's not predetermined. It was never predetermined that it will reach this form, um, you know, with the galaxies where they are and uh, dark energy and dark matter and all of this. So. Uh, yes, there is, although there is order as we've been discussing, but it is not a predetermined set of uh, conditions that allowed it to evolve to where it is today. And I, and I suspect, Dennis, that's what you were saying earlier about the 
the the cells, right? Well, otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we yeah. wouldn't be here discussing it. <laughs> but there may be tendencies. I mean, we talk about how people think there couldn't be any purpose, not in the sense of a designer God, and right. the kind of purposes or tendencies in the universe. But I think we agreed that. The, the, well, I are. think there is evidently so. Yes. I mean, not in the sense that. Um, to how best to put this, I, um, I'm, I'm not a particularly good metaphysician, but <laughs> let, let me try and put it very briefly. There is a sense in which organisms have evolved purpose, and it would be crazy for us to deny that that is the case. Otherwise, we cannot understand ourselves. Now, if one wants to say, but that means that in some sense or another, that capacity, that ability was baked into the structure of the universe from the very beginning. If you want to call that your religious metaphysics, then so be it. That doesn't worry me. And it doesn't, it seems to me, uh, mean that it, it sort of proves any particular uh, religious interpretation no, no, of the no, universe. Um, that wasn't my point. And you know. I, I think <laughs> I, I get where you were going to. And that's very important because one of the misinterpretations of what I've been doing recently by specifically young earth creationists is, well, we told you so, you know, all of these theories were wrong. Uh, now, that is a very deep misunderstanding of what I've been doing. Well, but I, at the same time, I do say, yes, purpose theory really does exist in living organisms. Now, whether you say that that it was inevitably going to arise within the universe because it is structured as it is or not, I don't know. Okay, so taking a step back now, just trying to get an overview of all of this, we have this mm. very curious relationship between order and disorder, between symmetry and asymmetry, which seems quite counterintuitive, and paradoxical, but it's definitely there. I mean, it's, it's on the edge between order and disorder. That's where it, it all seems to happen. Um, in all disciplines and in extending beyond that into music and architecture and so on. Um, I just wanted to read a little extract from the book, the forthcoming book, which Dennis and I are editing, uh, to which Dimitri has contributed, uh, which is the language of, language of symmetry. And in the preface, um, it says, if symmetry were life's order in principle, then it would, ne it would necessarily have infinite reach and encompass everything, including itself. This would create a paradoxical universe of symmetry and asymmetry, of cosmos and chaos. Our universe, in other words, a place of infinite symmetries in which the coexistence of order and disorder is not only in evidence, it's inevitable. If symmetry has no deeper cause in itself, then the cosmos has been structured in the only way possible. And I think that's, I mean, it's, it sounds terribly grandiose to talk about life's order in principle and so on, but there is clearly a relationship between order and disorder that we don't understand. And it would logically make sense that if symmetry were nature's order in principle, if it were to polarize itself, you would get symmetry and asymmetry coexisting. Um, and, you know, this is borne out by looking at the world around us. So I was recently uh, watching a group of people no uh, negotiating a bottleneck as they filed into a lecture theatre. And I observed what I, as a, as a layman, would describe as chaos. But any social scientist would tell us that the, the, uh, the behavior of a cluster of people conforms to broadly predictable patterns, patterns which are uh, determined by factors such as geometric boundary conditions or time gap distributions and so on. And it's these factors which are calibrated in order to, uh, you know, change the design structures within lecture theatres, for example. So in the world around us, there is this curious, I mean, even walking into a lecture theatre, we see order and disorder. We see order existing, or order, uh, sorry, randomness and disorder existing within a framework of order, I suppose is one way of putting it. Um, and I just wanted to kind of throw that thought experiment or that idea out there. Um, I did ask a friend of mine who's a mathematician a year or two ago, I said, what form would the universe take if it was subject to a, a law of symmetry? And he said, no serious mathematician would ever address a question like that. But for the nature of this, none of us is mathematicians, but for the nature of this conversation, for fun, do you think that this is a viable idea? The idea that symmetry could have infinite reach and polarize itself and create a universe of symmetry and asymmetry? Who's going to be brave enough to address this question? De Dennis? You be very silent, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you pose some very deep questions, Red. I, I think what you're getting at is that the, the 
the idea that there's a symmetry between order and disorder is itself fundamentally very strange. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I would say to people, well, get used to it, because that is how it is. And if it wasn't like that, we would not exist. So in one sense, you must be correct in saying what you're saying. They have to coexist. Now, what is our problem in understanding this? I think it is that we've got too simple an idea of causation. Our problem comes back to the one that Demetrius was pointing out right at the very beginning. There are the laws and there are the conditions. If a physicist doesn't control the conditions very, very carefully, he or she will not discover the laws. But the laws themselves, just on their own, are not sufficient. And that is true of all systems, physics or biology, that without the, the conditions under which things exist, it wouldn't be possible to understand how we'd exist at all. Now, the ancients over in the East had this idea, they called it conditioned arising. It's what you find in Buddhism and in Taoism. And it simply means the exact um, matching together of the order of the laws and the disorder of the conditions, which you elaborated out beautifully on at the very beginning. And there's our solution. Well, now, whether we're happy with that solution depends on whether we're happy with the one concept of cause rather than another. Okay. Uh, can I just put in a question here? Simon says, um, how uh, is this just something which applies theoretically or are there practical applications to this idea of the correspondence of symmetry and asymmetry? Now, Dennis oh, my goodness, are there. If you want to understand why we have made no great advances in treating late stage cancer, the metastatic stages three and four, one of the answers is that disorder is being used by those cancerous tissues to deal with the chemotherapy that we're attacking it with, to deal with the radiation we're attacking it with in a desperate attempt to control it. Sometimes we do, most of the time we don't because we provoke yet another radiation of disorder to create, in the end, the order that that tissue is looking for, its own survival. So yes, it is of great practical importance. There's no question about that. And since you published your paper, which you presented at the, uh, um, in Boston, I think, a year or two ago, the yes. American Association for Cancer Research has set up a... It has set could you up, tell us what they've set, set up? up the, uh, the, uh, the, the Working Group on Cancer and Evolution. That's its full name. And it's already got about a thousand members. I mean, the, people have woken up to the fact that the way in which you understand some of the big diseases of humanity is to realize the complex ones and the ones we're facing now as we face aging populations. The way we understand that is to see this um, attempt of order and disorder in living organisms to balance themselves and to manage to survive. And I think unless we do that, we won't deal with the big scourges of humanity today, which I'm afraid are the diseases of old age. Okay. So, I mean, it's not just a theoretical thing. This is, an idea, this is an idea which applies not only yeah. to genetics, astrophysics, neuroscience, music, architecture, but it actually has applications. Once we really understand this concept uh, and, and recognize, I suppose, the fact that we have to an extent misunderstood symmetry. Really. There's, there's a different form of symmetry which we've ignored, mm. um, which is the symmetry of order and disorder, whether we describe it as a polarity of opposites or how we frame it. But that's, you know, it's where order and disorder meet. Clearly that's where it all seems to happen. And the bit which scientists and philosophers have routinely ignored is where it all happens really. Okay, well, uh, unless anybody would like to add any final comments, we're coming up to um, half past now. Oh, ooh, let's just see, we have um, more questions coming in. I'll just ask one more question. Amy asks, is the idea of a hidden hand of order chaos in danger of being co-opted by political or philosophical groups? Um, for example, nihilism, there's no point of trying to change anything, or conservatism, Eben Burke once said, good order is the foundation of all good things. So uh, is the idea of uh, a hidden hand of order chaos in danger of being co-opted by political or philosophical groups? Any intellectual idea can be co-opted by, by people that you don't want to hear, hear co-opting it. Um, 
the problem I have because people don't really understand what I'm talking about. I think that it says something about it. And it's interesting, isn't it, in politics, uh, how extremes seem to meet. You can hardly get a razor blade between, oh, you know, um, forms of fascism or communism, or I, I could almost see Tony mm. Benn and um, Enoch, Powell. Enoch Powell exactly sitting down to dinner together and having a jolly good tin wag. I think it's interesting how opposites seem to mm. seem to meet. There's, there's, yes. there's something going on there that we don't, we don't fully understand. I think moral space is curved, is what I say. Absolutely. <laughs> and I think what, what we've done this evening is we've, you know, we've explored this idea a little further. It's something which, um, Ian, you're exploring in detail in your work, and uh, as are you, Dennis. In fact, Dennis, you first presented a paper on this idea, I believe, at the Royal Society in 2016. Yes, it was in 2016, yes. It was a direct challenge to the neo Darwinists. you know, you got it wrong. And wow. I have been working on this for years. You've worked on it for decades. I think it's jolly interesting that in a funny sort of way, different people seem to be picking up on this idea, mm. the correspondence mm. of opposites of the, the, the symmetry of, of asymmetry and symmetry. Um, and there's still obviously a lot to be worked out about it, about the mechanisms by which it works, but it is absolutely fundamental. And it's an idea which has been, I believe, largely overlooked. Uh, and it's interesting to see what the next few decades will bring in terms of exploring this idea and perhaps redefining symmetry or finding a new word for it altogether. Thank you so much. It's been a fascinating evening and um, most enjoyable. And um, I think we will leave it there, but thank you for joining us.